now we're going to talk about depicting these electric fields in a graphical manner. This is very, very important. Uh, there's all kinds of problems you can figure out just by drawing the field graphically, especially in AP Physics 1 and 2. Uh, they want you to be able to represent these fields, and many questions will just be simply qualitative. Can you draw this field properly to understand what's going on? Now, there are two different methods of depicting these fields. Both have their advantages. Uh, depicting them in space, and these are both commonly used. Um, electric field lines is one of them. We're going to show both. Electric field lines is one of them. And the other one is called electric field vectors which are mapped on a grid. Both of these have their advantages. One very important thing, though, that you should be aware of, if you are taking AP Physics 1 or 2, uh, on the 1 and 2 exams, only the field vectors uh, mapped on a grid, those are the only type that they use. Uh, they won't ask you to draw field lines, but they may ask you to draw a vector field. So let's talk about both of these different methods and some of the advantages and disadvantages of them. Electric field lines. What you do here, and this is just a little drawing over here in the corner of electric field lines being used, they point in the direction of the electric field at every point. Uh, so in other words, right here on this spot right here, if I go ahead and draw that in, at this point right here, the electric field's pointing that way. Whereas at this spot right here, it's pointing that way. At this spot right here, it's pointing that way. So at every point on there, uh, they show the direction right here, the electric field's pointing that way. These lines show the direction of the electric field along that line. Um, the magnitude of the field. It is, the way you express it with electric field lines is by the number of field lines per unit area, which are uh, through a surface perpendicular with the field lines. In other words, to figure out the field strength right here, what I would do would be I would set up a just a, a, a sheet right here. And then how many field lines are cutting through that that are perpendicular to the this sheet? That is, the more field lines there are, the stronger the field is. That simply translates to the closer together that these lines are, the stronger that the field is. So you can just, by just looking at, the, at these things, you can figure out in large part how strong the field is, where is the field strongest here? Well, where are they close together? Right there in the middle, that's where the field is strongest. It's weakest way out here because these lines are so far spread out. So the magnitude of the field is proportional to the number of lines per unit area uh, that these things cut through. Though these lines, these field lines, always go out of positive charges. Notice they leave, the arrows are pointing out of the positive charge, and they always go into negative charges. And an advantage of these, this type of uh, mapping is that the number of lines leaving or entering a charge is proportional to the magnitude of the charge. So you see on this picture, this is 2q, this is 1q. Let's count the lines leaving this thing. Well, I'm counting 1, 2, 3, whoops, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 field lines leaving that. And I'm guessing that if we count the number of field lines going into this one, there's going to be eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Sure enough, there are, because this is double the charge of this magnitude-wise, so it's got to have double the number of field lines as this does. Now, uh, where do all these guys end, though? If these charges started positive, or if these lines started positive charges and end at negative charges, where are these ending? Well, what we do to deal with that is we just assume the following. If you have an isolated point charge or lines like this that have no uh, pair, uh, the field lines are assumed to end at opposite charges which live at infinity. So these opposite charges, these end at infinity, you can say they end at, the, uh, at other negative charges that are hanging out there. Now, advantages of using this type of uh, mapping is that you can more easily determine magnitudes of charges because the number of lines are proportional to the charges. You can qualitatively assess field strength. I can see the field right here is strong and it's weaker out here because there's fewer lines out here. Uh, 
when we deal with Gauss's law, especially with the C kids, uh, it's easier to understand in terms of these lines because flux is essentially the number of lines that puncture a surface. Uh, these are tend to be more easily drawn than the uh, field vectors. The other way that we can depict fields is with these electric field vectors. Now, uh, electric field vectors, they are fields represented by arrows at points on a grid that are uniformly distributed. Uh, each grid point has one vector with its tail on the grid point, and the vector points in the direction of the field of that grid point, and the length of the vector is proportional to the magnitude. Uh, some depictions use different colors or different shades for the different magnitudes. Uh, the AP Physics 1 and 2, uh, they want you to use lengths to depict the magnitudes. Some advantages are that AP Physics 1 and 2 use only this type, so if you're doing AP 1 and 2, you got to use it. They're easier to compare field strength because if a, a vector is double the length, it has double the strength. Uh, and it also uh, specifies the electric field direction and magnitude at many more points in space than the field lines do. Best way to understand this is just to look at the two different methodologies and how they're used. So this is a just a simple isolated positive charge. Where do these end? They end at infinity at little negative charges that all have to add to the same amount. Um, you, can you can depict it with field lines or you can depict the same field with these field vectors. Notice that closer to this thing, the field vectors are longer. As you get farther away, they're shorter, meaning it's weaker. Each field vector, notice this is a grid, there's all these different points and they're evenly spaced. Um, each vector shows the direction of field at that point, which is really the tail end of this thing. That's what the this vector represents uh, the field right at that it's it's at its base point right there. Uh, let me do another color here so you can see that. This vector represents how strong the field is right there. This vector represents how strong the field is right there. And this vector represents how strong the field is right there. Um, so you can see you can see the field at a lot more points here. But this is really showing this thing on the left is really showing the same thing. Uh, notice that we see the field is, is stronger closer, it's weaker farther away, but we can also see here the field is stronger closer because these lines are closer together, it's weaker far away. Okay, let's take a look at some other charge dis distributions. Uh, here is a negative charge. Notice that the field lines all point into this thing. Where do these field lines all start? At some positive charges way out in infinity. Uh, this field vector way of depicting it. Notice that again, uh, the fields point, the field vectors point in towards the charge. It looks like the uh, the head, the arrowhead of the vectors of some of these guys is hidden behind the charge. Uh, again, uh, it's uh, they get weaker as you go farther out, but they all point in the direction of the field. Notice that a negative charge, uh, the direction of the field is defined by the force on a positive test charge. So if I put a positive test charge right there, it would point like that arrow does. In it, The force on it would point in like that. Now, when we get to other more complicated charge distributions, uh, both of these different methods have their advantages again. So here is a positive and negative dipole. So let's take a look at this. Um, so here's our positive and negative charges. We can see that the field is strongest in between the two charges and it points from the positive to the negative. Uh, as we get farther away, the field gets weaker. Um, and we can see the same thing from our field vectors right here. Um, so you can see you do get different looking drawings, but these represent the same thing. This is the positive charge here and that's the negative charge right there. So that's a positive and negative dipole. Now something interesting, as you get farther and farther away from these two charges, what is the field like really far away from them? You can see out here these vectors are very, very tiny. And if you go way farther out, they'd probably just be like little barely detectable vectors. So when you get farther, far away from a dipole, it's like you're looking at the net charge of zero. Because uh, that's what it is. A dipole is a positive negative charge. They cancel each other. Uh, that happens, it turns out, I believe it goes down as R cubed, uh, but uh, 
qualitatively, the field goes down very rapidly as you get farther away from this dipole because you're equally far away from the positive and negative charges. Let's take a look at two positive charges and what the field due to that would look like. Oh, very interesting. The field lines themselves kind of repel each other. And field lines can never cross, by the way. Why cannot they cross? If they crossed, that would mean that the field's going in two directions at once, which is not possible. The only direction has got to be the direction that if I put a positive test charge right at this spot right there, which way would the force be on it? The force on it would be in that direction. This does not mean that charges follow these lines. They don't. But what they do is that if you put the object right, a positive test charge right there, it'll be forced in the direction of the field lines. Same thing goes over here. Uh, here again, we have a, a two positives, positive there and a positive there. And you can see how this map works right in between the two charges. You can see how the fields point directly upward uh, because this is almost, it's a little bit closer to this positive charge. So you can see how it's a little bit slanted right there. Right here, right halfway in between them, it is directly upward because the left and right components of the two fields cancel right in the middle. Down here, it's directly downward, same reason. And as you can see, halfway in between these two charges, directly in the middle, the field is, of course, zero.